This episode has been updated from the original to improve the accuracy of certain statements. Hello, everyone. This episode is going to be different than the other ones we've released up to this point. I want to fill you in on some details about the case and the upcoming trial, but first I'd like to talk about rescues and the FACE Act. A rescue is a variation on the common sit-in protest. Typically, that meant that a group of people would agree to block the doors of an abortion mill before they opened on kill days and refuse to allow anyone to enter the building. The pro-life rescue movement really kicked off in 1986 when Randall Terry founded Operation Rescue. Other groups, such as the Missionaries to the Preborn and Lambs of Christ, used similar tactics, though there was often disagreement between the groups as to what methods were appropriate. A common refrain was, no babies will be killed here today. Rescues often led to arrests and various charges at the local level, usually concerning trespassing or something similar. A few mills even established buffer zones around the building, making it illegal for any form of protest, even sidewalk counseling, to happen within a certain radius of the building. We've seen similar legislation in the UK pass in 2023, establishing a 150-meter radius around every abortion mill. Even silent prayer is criminalized in those zones. There was a lack of unity in the pro-life movement. Everyone agreed that abortion was wrong, but that's about where the agreement ended. Some people wanted to take direct action like rescues. Others condemned that as too extreme and wanted to focus all energy on legislative efforts. Even among the people who performed rescues, there was disagreement. Some only wanted to sit in front of doors. Others wanted to chain them shut and use large blocks of concrete or other heavy items to make it more difficult for the officials to remove the obstacle and reopen the mill. Others opposed violence against people, but advocated for damaging property. And, unfortunately, a few believed that murdering the abortion doctors was the correct course of action. However, the vast majority of the pro-life community was just that. Pro-life. And that meant that they were opposed to violence against people and property. It was mainly this group of people that saw tens of thousands of arrests over just a few years. And at least in part, if not primarily through their efforts, hundreds of abortion mills around the country were shut down. Rescues became a highly effective tool communities could leverage to stop something that they believed to be evil. Successful enough that Congress felt the need to get involved. In early 1993, Representatives Chuck Schumer and Constance Morella sponsored the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, or FACE for short. Ted Kennedy sponsored the Senate version of the bill. This bill was introduced as a direct response to protests and rescues that were happening across the country. There were a few people within the pro-life movement who were violent, and a few even murdered abortion doctors in cold blood. Those actions fueled the intensity and urgency of discussions within Congress. With the addition of a clause that gave places of religious worship the same protections as abortion mills, the FACE Act passed both the House and the Senate with bipartisan support. And so, the tactics that were seen to be so effective in the late 80s and early 90s became a federal crime, and the pro-abortion lobby achieved its goal of painting the entire pro-life community as violent and unreasonable. There were a few versions of the bill, with an early version prohibiting any hindering of access to clinics. That was rewritten because of the difficulty of defining what would constitute hindering and possible First Amendment issues should the legislation ever be challenged in court. However, it's worth noting that in a recent opinion from the Sixth Circuit Court, we find the following text. The United States submits that the FACE Act should be broadly interpreted to include all forms of physical obstructions to clinic access, even where those obstructions are temporary, incomplete, or do not employ particular tactics. This is a bit concerning, to say the least. I'm not a lawyer, nor do I give legal advice. Still, it sounds to me like a temporary and incomplete obstruction could be defined as almost any physical presence or protest. As we look at the political landscape today, it is very different than the 80s and 90s. Almost any political view from then would be viewed as pretty moderate today, and most of the liberals would be considered conservative. And in June of 2022, 
four months before the FBI raided Paul Vaughn, the Supreme Court handed down the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade. I thought that this meant that there were no more federal protections for abortion, but that's not exactly the case. There is still the FACE Act, and that had actually gone through the proper legislative channels and passed both houses of Congress. It doesn't enshrine the right to an abortion per se, but it does protect the right to access or provide reproductive health care services without a threat of physical obstruction, intimidation, or interference. In short, Roe v. Wade directly protected what the FACE Act indirectly protects. Moving forward, I think we can expect to see an increase in FACE Act prosecutions, as well as attempts to establish case law expanding the definition of what constitutes a violation of the FACE Act. Now, I'm about to get a bit technical, but I'll do my best to sum it up in the end. One of the only reasons the FACE Act passed both houses of Congress is that it has very strict limitations on the maximum severity of punishment for violations. For first-time nonviolent offenses, the charge is a misdemeanor, and the penalty is not to exceed more than six months in prison and a maximum fine of $10,000. A recent and unexpected move by the DOJ was the addition of conspiracy charges to certain FACE Act violation charges. There are two main types of conspiracy charges at the federal level. There is the common Title 18 U.S. Code 371, Conspiracy to Commit Offense or Defraud the United States, charge. Under a 371 conspiracy conviction, the punishment cannot be more severe than the maximum punishment for the original offense. Then, there is the other conspiracy charge, the one that the DOJ is tacking onto the face violation charges. A Title 18 U.S. Code 241 Conspiracy Against Civil Rights charge. Regardless of the original offense, a 241 conspiracy charge is always a felony. The maximum penalty is 10 years in federal prison and much heftier fines in the range of $250,000. This new strategy for combining FACE Act violation charges with a 241 conspiracy against rights charge is first laid out in a DOJ journal from March of 2022. So far, the Department of Justice has filed cases with this new strategy in four districts. Washington, D.C., Florida, Michigan, and Tennessee. The cases from D.C., Michigan, and Tennessee are all a result of pro-life protests at abortion clinics. The D.C. trial recently concluded with nine people being convicted of both a 241 conspiracy charge and violation of face for a rescue performed in 2020. This group includes three women in their 70s who have been involved in pro-life ministry for decades. They have not yet been sentenced, but they are currently incarcerated due to the judge's classification of their actions as violent. Once again, I'm not a lawyer, but there is video of this rescue on the internet. If you would like, you can go see for yourself and determine if these grandmothers are violent. The trial in Michigan is scheduled for April. That is a result of a rescue that happened in Detroit. The case in Florida is not due to a pro-life protest, but concerns a group of people who vandalized a Catholic pregnancy center. This trial appears to be scheduled for some time in March. Now, let's talk about the case in Tennessee, since those are the defendants we've been introducing you to. A rescue was performed at a Carafem clinic in Mount Juliet, Tennessee in March of 2021. This particular clinic has an interesting history. Mount Juliet did not want them to perform surgical abortions and did everything they could to prevent them from doing so in 2019. The COO of Carafem even stated that they had, quote, never experienced the kind of explicit targeting that we received from politicians in the city of Mount Juliet, Tennessee. It was a federal injunction that forced Mount Juliet to remove the ordinance that was preventing Carafem from performing surgical abortions, allowing this clinic to offer the full range of so-called reproductive health care. As a result of the rescue at that clinic, five people were charged with violation of the FACE Act, and six people were charged with the violation of the FACE Act and conspiracy against rights under Title 18 U.S. Code 241. Paul Vaughn and Chet Gallagher, whom we'll introduce to you in a couple of episodes, learned that they were facing charges when they were raided by the FBI, though Chet was out of town on the day of the raid. 
he willingly turned himself in once he learned of the charges. The other defendants were either served papers or notified via a polite phone call of their charges. The trial in Nashville is set to begin on January 16th. These past few months have been full of legal activity, motions to dismiss, offers of plea deals, pre-trial restrictions, etc. But this is where things seem to stand today. There are multiple landmark cases that are about to be tried that could dramatically affect the outlook of pro-life ministry in the United States. The Department of Justice is actively working to expand the definition of what constitutes violence and obstruction to the point that even sidewalk counseling could be considered a violation of the FACE Act, and any planning or coordination of those efforts could be considered a conspiracy to violate rights. If the DC trial is any indication of what's to come, none of these trials have a very positive outlook. At this point, we don't actually know what the penalties under a conviction with this new strategy will be. The DC group is set to be sentenced in May, so it's likely that we won't know until then. Please be in prayer for the individuals facing these charges and their families, and for those that are in prison waiting to be sentenced. Pray that the hearts of those who want to protect the temples of death will be changed. And pray that we as a nation would repent of the sin of child sacrifice. We will be publishing updates regularly on the podcast, on our YouTube channel, and on Twitter when the trial starts in January. You can also sign up for our email newsletter at stifledcry.com. Please consider subscribing and sharing episodes as they come out. We want Christians everywhere to hear the stories of these normal people who are doing their best to live out their calling faithfully and are now facing years of imprisonment for doing just that.